Hello and welcome to Food Integrity Now, advocating integrity in our global food supply. I'm one of the hosts, Carol Grave, and I'm here with Matt Spaeth and Susan Wright. Welcome. Thank you. We have as our guest today, Francis Mangles, and we're going to be talking about chemtrails. And rather than me give you his long list of accolades, Francis, will you let us know why you are qualified to talk about chemtrails? Greetings. How's the system? Everything working? Everything's working. Hey, okay. Well, yep. um, I have my college degrees, Bachelor of Science in Forestry Cum Laude, Master's of Science in Zoology from the University of Montana, uh, 35 years federal scientist, USDA, Soil Conservation Service and U.S. Forest Service, Range Wildlife Biology, minors in about a dozen other subjects, but suffice it to say they're in things like botany, chemistry, wildlife management, ichthyology, master's thesis without aquatic insects. If they want it down home, down home well, we're, I'm from a farm area in uh, Montana. And in case anyone out there doesn't know what chemtrails are, give us a quick overview of that. Well, chemtrail has uh, the disinformation folks have given that a dirty word that it's kind of a wild-eyed scheme that they're trying to do some kind of population control or et cetera from the skies. But quite frankly, a chemtrail is another word for our preferred word is to say it's geoengineering. It's a uh, patent by a Mr. Wellsbach where you spray fine particles into the air, these disperse into stratosphere's clouds, reflect sunlight back into outer space, and this is supposed to prevent global warming. And actually, it's a zero-sum game, but we can get into that later. So chemtrails is geoengineering by high-altitude jet planes. Can you tell the difference visually uh, between a, just a regular contrail and a chemtrail? Well... Um, I've looked at lots and lots of jet planes through a nice 400-power astronomical telescope that I've got, although a uh, a uh, spotting scope will do just about as well. And let's just say that there's something mighty peculiar about a jet with uh, a vertical exhaust in it, two engines, leaving uh, three, three uh, contrails. That's very strange for a jet, don't you think? Yeah. yeah. Certainly. Let's go back um, for a sec. Um, what? Oh, sorry. But uh, what? Is, what is the purpose of this geoengineering? Uh, theoretically, they figure if they burn enough jet jet fuel and spray hard enough and long enough, it'll prevent the planet for wa- from warming up by reflecting the particles that they're spraying out of the jet. Uh, is supposed to reflect heat back into outer space and prevent climate uh, change by uh, global warming. It's, we know global warming is taking place. It's 10,000 scientists to one in the debate now that we are certainly causing global warming, and this is the uh, way that the powers that be, the military-industrial complex, has uh, decided to fight geoengineering rather than look at something more simple like conservation, for instance. And the visual difference between a chemtrail and a contrail from someone standing on the ground is is what? The main thing that the average person would see without spotting scopes to look to look at the jet directly, they would see. Well, when we were kids, you see a jet go across the sky, and all the kids would look up. Oh, we hear a jet, and you'd see a. Oh, there it is, and there's a jet with a uh, contrail, maybe a finger's length long, maybe 20 jet lengths behind it, and it disappears in a couple of minutes. Uh, A chemtrail or the geoengineering jet uh, leave a streak that goes clear across the sky from one horizon to the other, and it usually lasts somewhere around 6 to 20 hours. So how do we know that this is actually being done? What what kind of 
What kind of hard evidence do we have? The hard evidence is uh, I have it in my hand as we speak is uh, lab test after lab test after lab test that shows extremely high amount of aluminum, barium, and strontium. And there's some new evidence come in that's a very much of a Wellsbach patent fingerprint that shows extreme amounts of unusual chemicals in the air and in the soil, and this is affecting uh, definitely the agriculture in California. Uh, appears to have substantial effects on human health, but our main hard data is all these lab reports that we've got. And I can read you some of the actual reports from the lab if you're interested here. Yeah. Okay. Well, here's a, here's one uh, from uh, Upper Ski Bowl parking lot in Mount Shasta. This is at 8,000 feet, roughly. Aluminum. 61,100 micrograms per liter. Barium, 83 micrograms per liter. Strontium, 383 micrograms per liter. Um, here's another one. Interesting. Uh, uh, let me interrupt uh, just for one second. So with the, with the aluminum, barium, and strontium, uh, where, where else could that have come from up there? There is no other place where it could come from. We don't have any factories. We don't have any smokestacks. This is Northern California, where practically the whole world is national forest. There right. are no factories. There are no industrial plants. There's nothing to the west of us around here. There's nothing to the east of us. The nearest stuff to the north of us is about 300 miles, and the nearest stuff to the south of us is about 300 miles over in San Francisco. There is no other source we can think of for this stuff to be coming from. What is what is barium and strontium used for? Um, well, actually, it's a nice ingredient in rat poison. Mm. And strontium is, we really don't know where in the world that's coming from in such extremely high concentrations. Okay, and uh, those—that's a very high concentration of aluminum too. What is, what are some of the effects of that on on the biosphere and also human health? Well, it does concentrate uh, before you. If you if sixty one sixty one thousand is not enough, here's an example. This is from a uh, wildlife watering device near uh, Redding, California, aluminum of uh, 375,000 micrograms per liter, barium 3,090, strontium 345 micrograms per liter in the water. This is, quite frankly, rather violently poisonous stuff that we're feeding the deer around here. Is uh, you're talking mostly about California. Is this consistent with other uh, samples from other places in the country or the world that you're aware of? Yes. We have samples from the northeast, samples from um, the uh, northern tier states around Montana, uh, the Dakotas. We have samples from Washington, Oregon, California, Arizona. The only place we don't have samples from, oddly enough, is the deep south, the hmm. southeastern United States. We don't have any samples from that area yet. But everywhere else we go, this uh, aluminum barium strontium is uh, very much in the fingerprint, and it's extraordinarily high. I understand that you've contacted some government agencies concerning these chemtrails. What are what are some of the responses that you've had? Um, the United States Department of Agriculture said, um, direct quote, you're not worth a reply. Um, various um, water pollution agencies and air pollution agencies looked at the data and they said, we're not interested. We don't know. We don't have to 
objective go away. That, that's the summary of it. And I might add that when I took this data down to the Forest Service with this information about what's in the wildlife watering devices, they were very insulting and rude, which is surprising for a district ranger in the U.S. Forest Service to be insulting and rude. Uh, and they just said, uh, we're not interested. Go away. Wow. Uh, I won't tell you what they said, but they were quite rude about it. It's interesting because here you have the data, you you have proof, and yet they're not even willing to take a look at your information and dispute it. 